Jimmy, how are you today? We're good. We're, you know, quarantined and and we have been since last. Well, it's going to be a year soon. I've been trying to work at home, do some songwriting and catch up on my correspondence, I guess. <laughs> yeah. A little writing. Uh, I'm trying to get some songs ready for next year. I actually never thought I would would be uh, shedding sentimental tears over a, a joint in uh, Kansas City, Missouri called Knuckleheads. <laughs> but the other night I was thinking, gee, I wish I was back at Knuckleheads <laughs> with the blues with the blues bands playing, you know, in a yeah. different room. And trains coming by, you know, with wh- blowing their whistles, and probably one of the gnarliest <laughs> live gigs in America. But I, I found myself kind of, kind of reminiscing, you know. It's no secret to anybody who's ever watched any of my shows. Wichita Lyman's in my top five favorite songs of all time. Sometimes it's number one, sometimes it's number five, and sometimes it's in the middle of it. I absolutely, it's it's a masterpiece of songwriting. It's a masterpiece of production. It's a beautiful uh, vocal from Glenn. Everything about that song. Um, it just got inducted into the uh, National Recording Registry of the Library of Congress last year. Well, now nine, 2019. I mean, this song has been recorded and covered by Ray Charles, Guns N' Roses, Keith Urban, Smokey Robinson. Jose Feliciano, R.E.M., I, I mean, the list is endless. To have a song that powerful, is it the most special thing for you? Do you, do you hold it in a, in a high regard because you've got you know, guys like me waxing lyrically about it? I wonder how much well, as your own creation um, you feel, you know? I'm gratified that, you know, we're still talking about it. You know, like here we are 50 years later, we're still talking about it. Sure. Uh, sure. That's something that I never anticipated, and I have a healthy ego. I I, I, I don't <laughs> I won't deny it, but I never really saw you know the long look. I never looked down the years or up the years to some other some other reality, which is basically where we are now. We we don't live where that song was written at all. Uh, I mean, this country has changed so much that I have to really sit down and think about the 60s and try to imagine what it was like, try to put myself back in those shoes because it was such a different place. Most of us, I think, and I, I hate to be speaking for everybody, but I know a lot of songwriters and most of us didn't have a historical view of what we were doing. We had, it was like disposable music. As soon as it comes down the charts, you make another one and send that one up the charts and God help you if you can't do it, you know, because you're only as good as your last fling on the charts, which is kind of a cruel environment for sensitive, soulful people like songwriters. There's always been friction at the, where the rubber meets the road, where the, Record company meets the artist. There's always been a kind of friction that's kind of based on that. I remember Jerry Lasker was one of the last of the great kind of record, uh, I don't know whether you would call them impresarios or tyrants or what you, you know, (laughs) pick your word, but he had a cigar about this long, you know. He was up at six o'clock in the morning calling radio stations. And saying, "Are you on the? You know, are you on the record yet?" And the first time I walked in his office, there was a big sign over his desk that said, "You hear a lot about Vincent, but what about Theo?" Yeah, that's a great. And of great course, line. that would be Vincent Van Gogh. I know exactly what you mean, and the letters that he published after he died. And yeah. and and yeah. Vincent and Theo. Theo was the money man. Mm, yeah. Um, he was the guy who supported. Uh, oh, the 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 letters. You're absolutely right. They were always pleas for money. Please send me some more money. And of course, Vincent 
grudgingly sent some money. I knew who Jay was when I read that when I when I read that sign. Uh, and he was he was the last of a breed, but he 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 meddled in the studio to a degree that irked me. And it was out of that kind of uh, unrest between with him pushing his nose into the uh, he had a you know he had a guy in the studio uh, reporting back to him on what I was doing in the studio, <laughs> right? Yeah, <laughs> and it, like Howard Hughes or somebody, you know, <laughs> and and I I found out about it. I found that I found out that there was a spy in the control room. That's sad. See, that's another variable that uh, people don't think about. One of them is plain luck. A lot of it is just luck. You're just in the right place at the right time, and you've got the right people in the studio, and you've got the right song and the right artist. And it it has a certain destiny about it. So there's there's luck, which is an infinite variable. Then there's there's variables that can be controlled to some degree, which are relationships, the atmosphere and inside the studio. You can try to keep a a nice like a cool uh, vibe going in the studio, where everybody's relaxed and doesn't feel like. They're being yelled at. You were so young when you got started. I mean, you were 17 when you were surrounded by the Wrecking Crew. I was. They were, well, Larry Nechtel taught me to play piano in the studio. He sat right beside me for like 10 years. Sometimes he was playing organ and I was playing piano or vice versa. And then for a while, I played a Baldwin electric harpsichord and he played piano. Piano was his axe, and I just watched. He never instructed me. He never said, here's how you do an intro. He would just play one. He would just play one. And I'd go, oh, how do you do that? <laughs> I just soaked up everything that he, that he did. And Hal Blaine was my first real believers. I, he, he played on my very first session in Hollywood. And he came over to me after the session and he said, kid, he said, I hope you're going to stick with this. And I remember when I got my Grammy award about two years later for a song of the year for Up, Up and Away, the first person to have his arms around me was Hal Blaine. He said, I told you you could do it, kid. You know, it's, it's, like, a, it's like a Hollywood movie. Yep. So those guys, no, I love those guys, you know, and, and Glenn Campbell, who was my, my partner, you know, he had been in the, the wrecking crew and um, a guy that that's not mentioned a lot. Al Casey was one of the guys who was really good and the, the volume control expert. And he was like brilliant and, and so nuanced was Mike Dacey. And there was a flute player named Bud Shank who was in the in the wrecking crew as well. They weren't all rhythm players. There were two bass players. There were Joe. There was Joe Osborne, and there was Carol Kay, and they would switch off. And it, for a while, there were two drummers. There was Jimmy Gordon, and there was Hal Blaine. And the first time I ever saw Jimmy Gordon, he came in to substitute on a Hal Blaine date. And it was a commercial <laughs> and Hal sent this guy in and I was sort of bent out of shape. I thought, Hal Blaine, you're getting too good to play on a commercial, right? And I fell in love with Jimmy Gordon. He was like a drum machine before they invented drum machines. His time was impeccable. So the... The Wrecking Crew was really like a more fluid than people give it credit for. It was almost like the Samba School in Rio de Janeiro, where part of it was schooling, part of it was experience, and there was a turnover. 
and there were guys who played they played in there for a while and took their experiences away and taught other people and it, it was uh I, I've always believed that they should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I don't know whether they are, but they should be. Agreed, 100%. They played, uh, they played on so many hit records that you, you literally can't count them. Because when you think you've counted them, another one will show up. <laughs> you say, oh, this one too. They were on this too. What was the first song that you worked with them on? I was doing a song for uh, Johnny Rivers. I was still signed to Johnny Rivers Music. And I, we, I was doing a song called By the Time I Get to Phoenix, which was recorded, he recorded on his album Rewind, which was kind of a reverberation of the whole British invasion. It was kind of a it was kind of uh, it was a kind of a response, in the sense that Sergeant Pepper was kind of a response to Pet Sounds. I know I speak very authoritatively about these things, and and sometimes it annoys people. But I know for a fact that Sergeant Pepper was caused, was influenced, was germinated because of Pet Sounds. Absolutely. And in fact. Sir George uh, told me one time, he said, no, uh, Jimmy, he said, there's no, there's, there's, there's no equivocation. He said, it was the boys trying to answer the Beach Boys. And I think they did a pretty good job. <laughs> <laughs> they did a good job, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then Johnny was doing his, his sort of, answer to Sergeant Pepper, which was this album called Rewind. And he did By the Time I Get to Phoenix. And Marty Pache did the, uh, the strings. The demigod among the Hollywood arrangers, like Don Costa, like Billy Strange, like Gene Page. Some of these people you don't hear about anymore. They're, you know, the arrangers are kind of like the unsung heroes, really, of the, of the whole deal. But I was all, all ears and watching everybody and trying to learn. Because something, something inside me told me, this, this is not always going to be like this. This, this is not, there's, there's an intensity to this. There's an immediacy and there's a, there's a, a, a volume of music. There was a tremendous demand for songs. I couldn't write enough songs to keep up with the demand. On some extinctive level, I knew this, this is going to, someday this is going to end. So I was anxious to absorb as much of it as I possibly could. Now, how did uh, Glenn end up singing on that song? There have been several stories circulating about how Glenn came to record that song for years and years. But the best story and the one that holds the most water, in my view, is Johnny River's story. Because on the Rewind album, as I just said, he had recorded By the Time I Get to Phoenix. And he was, I was signed to his publishing company. He was very interested in me getting a leg up and uh, went out of his way to help me. And one of the things he did is he called Al DeLore and he said, I want you guys to come over to my house tonight and listen to my test pressing on my new record. And so they came and it sat down. Glenn and, and uh, Al and Johnny played his record and he got over to, by the time I get to Phoenix, he stopped the record and he looked at those guys and they smiled at him and they said, why, why on earth are you, no, are you not recording that? As he said, that's, that's a hit. That's a stone cold hit. Johnny said, because Glenn, you can only have one number one record at a time. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I want to do something for Jimmy Webb. So he said, I want you guys to cut this 
song. Johnny had been following Glenn's career for years, knew that he was bubbling under. He had already released Universal Soldier. He had released, which, uh, you know, is, is a Dylan tune. He had a, a sort of a bubbling under hit on Gentle on My Mind. Glenn went off like he does or, or like he did in a, in a fever to cut this thing. And I mean, it, it was cut almost instantly. I mean, it was like two weeks later, I'm driving down the Santa Ana freeway and the radio comes on and it's Glenn Campbell singing by the time I get to Phoenix. I tell my audiences there was almost one of those epic 80 car pileups <laughs> on the Santa Ana freeway because I was everywhere, you know, trying to pull over. And uh, it was just such an emotional moment. Because I had dreamed of writing, well, I had I had dreamed of that moment since, since I was 14 years old. And I first heard Glenn sing, turn around, look at me. And I said, that guy is going to be huge one of these days. But I never dreamed that I, I mean, how could I imagine that I was going to play any part in his success? I mean, I was out in the middle of a, field plowing up wheat with a with a great big plow and an international harvester tractor and listening to my transistor radio and turn around and look at me stop me cold I, it was like that's the kind of song i want to write that's the kind of singer i want to work with this is an off the cuff question what do you attribute because when i when i hear those songs I mean, not knowing anything, sitting, you know, in my bedroom in England as a kid, I thought it's somebody who had lived fifty or sixty years in America and had this massive, you know, you know what I mean? It's so steeped, at least for us, it's so steeped in in Americana, if you like, um, for want of a better word. And yet, you're nineteen, twenty years old. I mean, what 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 do you attribute to that? I mean, it's a, probably a Interesting question to ask the songwriter, but you you know you wrote from such a sophisticated way, and you were able to to harness such incredibly powerful imagery for us. Um, I was talking to Laura about this before because she mentioned you know talk to him about um, Wichita being cinematic, and I I laughed because I said whenever we talk about Wichita Lyman, we always say how cinematic that song is. I'm a a, a great lover of film. I'm, a, I'm an aficionado. I'm a, I'm a fan of movies. And, you know, if I, if I have any, any regrets about my life, I, I, I guess I wish I had scored more movies. Uh, and maybe I'll get a chance to do some more before, before it lights out. But, uh, I think that all Amer that whole generation of American children really we were we were like the first people in history to go into a theater where the screen was like sixty feet long and thirty feet high and see something like Ben Hur, you know, see the Roman Empire come to life, you know, with this huge by the way, Oscar-winning score by Miklas Rosa, who was a, uh, one of the few composers to ever be regarded as a film composer and a classical composer. They don't, they don't hand that award out anywhere. You, you, you have to earn that. He, he was one of the few. And I can remember that one of the very first songs that I knew that I could sing was... Uh, from Gone with the Wind. I can remember hearing being in the back seat of my car 
and my mom and dad driving at night and hearing that on the radio. I remember that so vividly. And I, I believe, uh, I, I hope I'm not wrong when I say it was Tiomkin. I think it was Dmitry Tiomkin. So now I'm going to try to draw a parallel between our experience with films, which was a unique experience. Had no one had ever seen anything like 70 millimeter films because they were, in a sense, they were virtual experiences, you know? Before virtual experiences, we had these movies with wraparound sound and all this stuff. And for a while, they called it Cinerama. I grew up sort of imagining things in 70 millimeter. Seeing, I grew up seeing them in 70 millimeter. I, 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 I view things in a panoramic uh, a context. I don't, when I see a, a movie on TV that's in that little box that they used to watch, I'm not comfortable with it. I, as much as I love old movies, it feels confining to me because that big screen is really, you know, it's, it's in the DNA somewhere, you know, uh, you, you get it when you're a kid. And uh, I think it just naturally bled into my songwriting that I wanted, I wanted to write these big pictures. It's a pretty challenging thing to do when you realize that the average song probably has maybe 25 or 30 words in it. <laughs> total, total. Yeah, three and a half minutes maybe. It's very hard to be, for, to turn that into a 70 millimeter movie, you know? I fancy that that's the challenge that poets have always faced is describing immense emotions almost like world-shaking episodes of history, for instance, in, in the limited language and, and a space that's available to, to them. It's a special challenge for songwriters. I, I liken it to being a Swiss watchmaker because every, every word has to count. And at Motown, which is where my first job was, I had the educational experience of my life at Motown. They taught me everything. They would always say to me, and, and this is, mind you, I was a teenager. And they would say, yeah, but where's the message? You know, I'd play some thing with, you know, great chords and, you know, trying to be Miklos Rosa, you know. And they'd say, yeah, but where's the message, you know? what Jerome Kern used to call the burthen, the burden, which is another word for the cargo on a ship, the message, what is the thing that you're carrying with this song? What do you want to carry to the, to the person who listens to it, right? And I was indoctrinated. I took that very, very seriously, and it never let me down. And so there's a, uh, I'll say this, whatever they may be, and I don't say that they're the greatest songs ever written, uh, but whatever they are, they, by and large, uh, in, in the majority, have an A, B, C, beginning, middle, and ending quality to them. They're, they're finished stories. I don't like to leave a lyric dangling where you don't know what happened to the guy and you don't know what happened to the girl and you don't know what happened, you know? I'm not crazy about movies like that either. What comes in the middle is so important. I, and I always said, you know, the, to me, the most impor important line in a song is the first line because if you don't get them with the first line, you never get a second chance. So in the case of something like, by the time I get to Phoenix, since we're talking about it, by the time I get to Phoenix, she'll be rising, full stop. Okay, if I don't have you by then, I'm never gonna get you. So at the, at the outset, I have to pique your curiosity in some way to make you want 
to know why is this guy going to Phoenix? And what, who is she? And why will she be somewhere else? Why is she somewhere else? And why is she rising? <laughs> you know, and then I, I think the burden of it is to explain that opening line because that's a three verse form. That's a perfect specimen to dissect. Uh, when you get to the end of the third, ver uh, third verse, you tie it off. You tie it off maritime fashion, you know? She didn't know, she didn't think that I would really go. And only this time, he has done it. So in that, in that sense, you're, 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 you're making the audience wait for that resolution. And we all yearn for that resolution. Even in modern times, we, we like beginnings, middles, and endings. Well, I mean, the first two lines for me, you know, she'll be rising after you said Phoenix. There's so much, there's so many other ways of, you know, reading it for me. You know, obviously the Phoenix coming out of the ashes, you just use the, you know, the title of the, uh, of obviously Phoenix as a place. But I, I love that kind of double play, you know, it, it, it's such a beautiful imagery to me as a kid, the first time I heard it, I was just like, whoa, <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I find that a lot of times, I, and I, I be, must be absolutely frank with you, I, I had no such idea, mythology in mind at all. I was just talking about a guy driving a car to Phoenix, yeah. Yeah, it's Arizona. Uh, but a lot of times songs will, of their own volition, create secondary themes and some sometimes overarching themes like in 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 the song if these walls could speak the listener thinks that i'm writing about a house and i am i see what a tale they'd have to tell of sun going down and dinner bell and ch children playing hide and seek from floor to rafter if these old walls could speak and sh surely i'm talking about a house but by the time you get to the end of it, I'm saying in the last verse, if these old fashioned window panes were eyes, I guess they would have seen it all. And now you know that it's not a house, it's, it's the man himself. He's, he's the one who has put up the walls. And so that's when I say, you had this fully fledged out overarching theme all the way through, but it doesn't really become evident until right at the end you say, you know, this is a person writing about his own emotional state, about the walls that he's put up. If these old walls could speak, you know, if I could only tell you what I really want to tell you. Two layer songs are, are fascinating. Sometimes they happen of their own volition. Sometimes you can sort of push them along that way. If you see it's going that way, you can push it a little bit harder and, and sort of make it go that way. Uh, and sometimes, and I swear on a stack of Bibles, <laughs> it just happens. It happens unconsciously. You write the song, and then all of a sudden you're looking at the song, and you, and you go, I'll be damned. Look at that. There's another song behind this song, you know? So, so much of the work is done in the subconscious, I believe. Sometimes when, when I may appear, and I think that my wife thinks that I'm not doing anything at all, <laughs> uh, there's always a burner or two on, you know? Mm -hmm. So, it, in your book, The Cake and the Rain, you talk about meeting Elvis. In uh, 69, you talk a lot about it. You talk about the whole night, the glitzy Hollywood event with Nancy Sinatra. It, it sounds like a, almost like a religious experience for you. Was it, was it like a culmination of being a kid and growing up listening to Elvis's music and then finally meeting him? Well, at the time, I had already played Vegas. I had played the DI at Wilbur Clark's, which, alas, you know, has gone down the river with no return. 
but was a great Las Vegas landmark. And it was, it was often re just referred to as the DI. Everybody, everybody knew what the DI was. That was Wilbur Clark's. And Howard Hughes lived on the ninth floor, had the whole floor of the DI, and had all the windows blanked out when I played there. And the rumor was that he had television sets up there that he could watch anything that was going on in the hotel. <laughs> so, dirty old man, but uh, he was definitely looking at the performances. He had a video link to the showroom. So every night you were playing for Howard Hughes. So that would keep you on your toes. And the big thing about Elvis was this was his comeback. Now, to me, he was Elvis Presley, had always been Elvis Presley, and would always be Elvis Presley. I didn't quite understand the comeback thing. But it was because of the Beatles and because of the British invasion and because of all this change, the hate Ashbury scene, all the different influences that folk, the folk, the electric folk revolution was taking place at the same time. And it was like, well, I wonder how Elvis records would stand up to this. You know, there was a curiosity out there. And I went up as kind of a cynic because I never loved, I mean, I never absolutely loved Elvis Presley movies. And I thought that the songs, I loved the Jailhouse Rock and the early stuff. I loved that the movies were, I thought, kind of schlocky, you know, like um, Stevador. And they were vocational movies. He was like a different, he had a different job in each movie. He was a pilot. And he was a helicopter pilot in Hawaii. I think that was Blue Hawaii. And they wrote some kind of flaky material to support these very lightweight, lightweight plot scenes. And it kind of hurt him. I think it hurt him uh, with the serious music crowd. So there was some genuine curiosity and, and, and a lot of skepticism when the crowd went up from Hollywood to Las Vegas to see uh, Elvis's opening night. And, I, and I, I was there. A friend of mine and I decided to take mescaline for the occasion. <laughs> this was back in the day, okay. And mescaline is a it's, not a, it's not a drug, it's a spiritual experience. And he played at the International Hotel. I know what he was making. He was making $250,000 a week. And today that sounds like a paltry sum, but I know for a fact that that's what he was making. In the, um, it must be said that in that day and age, that was a lot more money than it is today, okay? I went in slightly cynical and sat down, and he came out in a black outfit and wearing a red sash in absolute perfect physical shape with kind of a Beatles cut, kind of a wild... Uh, not not a not a sprayed pompadour, but kind of a loose contemporary look. And he absolutely set the place on fire. He was like one of the most unbelievable performers that I've ever seen. And now, you know, I'm in, in my seventies. I'm not going to lie about that, you know. But um, in this this you know life, which has been longer than I thought it would be. <laughs> I have never seen the like of an Elvis Presley, I tell you that. And I became a fan. And this is after growing up in the 50s and listening to all this. The whole thing was, you know, it was over. And now I became a fan. I couldn't take my eyes. I was up there like every couple of weeks in the summer festival, which I think started sometime in August. And he played through August and maybe into December a little bit, uh, uh, September a little bit. And I was up there three or four times every year that he played. I think his last year, that first run, I think he played about three years in a row, three or four. It was very fluky. Actually, I have to tell you this part of the story because Elvis stories can go on all night. And I don't want to do that. But the first night I'm in there, I'm sitting up. They put me way up close to the stage. And I thought, wow, man, these are, these are great seats, man. I'm, I'm right up here in the, in, the, in the front row. 
and the and Jim Brown, the All American, you know, fullback, was sitting right across from me with his girlfriend, you know. So that was I was at one of the hot tables, and I didn't know really know why. And it, it, uh, the part of, it came to the part of the show where Elvis gave away the scarves. And if you didn't see this, if you weren't there in person, then you had no way. You have no way of knowing what this was. But he would walk down the a- apron of the stage, and he had like forty or fifty scarves around his neck, and he'd just peel one off and give it to this girl, and then she would kiss him. And it was full on interlingual, like you know. French kissing going on down there. And of course it was to these women. I mean, this was, this was like a once in a lifetime thing. He'd kiss them, he'd give them a scarf. And I'm noticing that I'm in that row where they're getting the scarves. <laughs> and he came down and I said, I hope to God he's not going to kiss me because I had long hair. <laughs> and uh, what, what do I do? You know, if he kisses me. And he came down to where I was, and he looked at me, and he had something in his hand, and he dropped it on my table. I swear on all the gods. I opened up that piece of paper, and it said, it was, it was in his printing, and he said, Jim, coming backstage, Elvis. <laughs> oh. <laughs> So as soon as the show was over, I feel these like two big burly uh, Nevada State Troopers who were, you know, on guard duty that night. They grabbed me from behind and my buddy who was with me, and they hauled us through the crowd and took us to this door and said, go back there, you know, and now we're backstage and it's mysterious and there's passages and things and we finally come up to this door and there's another guard and the door is standing about halfway open and Tom Parker's standing there. And he says, I guess y'all come back here to see Elvis, huh? And we said, Oh, we'd love to meet Elvis. And he said, well, just y'all come on in here. And we walked in and three or four steps later stepped into the, into the dressing room. And he was standing there with the whole Memphis rat pack standing around, around him. It was it was just it was just totally awesome. I, it was just really one of the most awesome things that's ever happened to me. I it had a diamond studded belt on that said Elvis, <laughs> <laughs> and he's he gave me his phone number, you know, <laughs> and he took my phone number. Nothing ever came of that, but. The story goes on. I uh, there was a there was a the beginnings of a friendship there, uh, which I would I, I I thought might might have been good for both of us, and it was it was snuffed out unceremoniously by Tom Parker, and I'm not you could you could ask Lieber and Stoller, and they they'd tell you the same thing, that they had a friendship with Elvis, and and uh, until Tom. Tom began to fear their their influence over Elvis because one thing Tom Barker didn't want was Elvis to be friends with songwriters. That was like not something he wanted because Elvis would start wanting to record things on his own. He wanted to record MacArthur Park. And... Tom Parker asked me if I would give up half the publishing to Elvis. Oh. You know, and I was flattered, but I didn't have to do that. I mean, there was, there was no way. I, I had my own publishing, and the, the business was moving on. And, you know, Tom was kind of stuck, stuck back there in the carnival world of, you know, yeah, I can make you a deal, son. You know, <laughs> <laughs> he had power, and uh, he used it to get rid of anybody that he wanted to get rid of. And you can check that story out because a lot of people went through the same thing. Well, I can one hundred percent believe it. I mean, that was his giant cash cow. He was not going to let anybody Absolutely. else. Absolutely, very, very yeah. protective. Yeah. 
that night was, you know, it was one of those nights, you know, I could never, it was like the night I got my Grammy for song of the year. I mean, there's certain nights that when you're, when you're standing on top of the mountain, you know. We did go past MacArthur Park, obviously, because um, that's, a, that's a, another track, obviously, with you producing as well as writing with uh, Richard Harris. Again, you must have been incredibly young. And, and Richard was a pretty well-known actor. I mean, a, you know, a, a major movie star. I, I can't imagine what that would feel like, you know, producing somebody of his stature. I had been uh, to see Camelot with Richard and uh, Vanessa Redgrave. I thought he sang the role pretty well. It was a runaway hit. It made, it made a lot of money. So it was in the back of my mind that he had some singing ability, and I was still working for Johnny Rivers at the time, so that would make me, again, 20, 21. Johnny sent me down to the Coronet Theater for an evening of poetry, dance, and music protesting the war in Vietnam. And I went because I was against the war and because he was my boss and told me to go. And I played the piano for all these things. I remember accompanying the great actor, Walter Pigeon. And I remember accompanying him on uh, an old Civil War song called Going Home. I play it, played it for him, um, and he sat, sat in a rocking chair, and he sang it. I, I, it was a wonderful night. I met Mia Farrow. I met, we became friends. I met Ed, Edward G. Robinson, who wow. was still around. Yeah, it was, it was like really old Hollywood. And the director was Richard Harris, and he was like a wild man. He was like swinging on ropes because this thing like – it told the history of warfare from the beginning of time to the end of time. I mean, it was, it was, again, it was the 70 millimeter lens, you know, on stage. And Richard was all in, you know, always played the king, you know. Uh, I mean, I, th I think his last role, he played Julius Caesar. And he was playing Dumbledore, who was like king of the wizards. He, he was always the king. We would hang out afterwards and drink. I was only an amateur at that point. <laughs> but uh, with Richard Harris, I went pro. <laughs> and uh, one night I threw my arm around him. I said, you know, Rich, one of these days we get, actually, I didn't, I didn't call him Rich. If I did, <laughs> he, would, he would have knocked my head off. I said, you know, Dick, one of these days we got to make a record. I probably said that to 150 people, you know, when I was a drunk. <laughs> And usually nothing came of it, but the company broke up, broke up. Everybody went back to England. We had our big night uh, against the war and it was a big success. And, and uh, I got my credit for having, being the musical director and, and the wrecking crew was there too. There wasn't much for me to do, but I got credit. About two weeks later, I get a telegram. This was the age of the telegram, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I'm not making this up. I got a telegram from London and it said, Dear Jimmy Webb, come to London, make record, love Richard. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> and I was on the hook because I, I was, I, it was my idea. I went in to see Jay Lasker, you know, the guy with, you hear a lot about Vincent, yep. but what about Theo? And, uh, I said, uh, Jay, I'm going over to London to make a record with Richard Harris. And he said, you're what? You're what? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody thought it was an, the most outlandish idea. 
And they still come up to me after a show and say, how come you picked Rich, Richard Harris? I, and it's, it's, in a way, it's, it's a little bit irritating to me because he wasn't an undiscovered talent as far as singing. He had just done a musical. His singing, I mean, I put him in ranges that were not, that were not uh, particularly flattering for him because I was more concerned about the, the tune and getting that right than I was about making the, the, the vocalist comfortable. I figured if the, if the vocalist was a little uncomfortable, there would be an intensity to it that, I, that would you know, play in my favor. Well, that, you know, it proved to be like a, a kind of a rotten theory over, over a long period of time. <laughs> But, you know, you notice sometimes that my songs tend to start quite low and then, and then end high because that's, that's the emotional line that I'm, I'm deliberately doing that. But it was a little bit hard on the, some of the singers. It really was. Not Glenn. He, could, he, could, he had a five-octave range, so he had, he had like... He had those two notes, which is hard to imagine, but he did. Beautiful. Well, MacArthur Park is is, is definitely a challenge. I read, um, and you can tell me if this is right, that Bones Howard had challenged you to write a song with of this sort of level of complexity and arrangement and tempo, etc. Is that correct? He wanted a a, a piece for, uh, for a rock band that sort of mimicked the movements of a classical concerto or, or perhaps even a symphony. Um, he wanted a, I knew what he wanted. He wanted a symphonic sound and he wanted it, and he wanted it for a group called the Association, who was, I was also you know, nuts about. I loved him. Along comes Mary and Cherish. I cherish is the word I use to describe. You know that one? So I, I dutifully went home, and actually he was, he was giving me a, a prime assignment. It was something I, it was in my blood already, as you know, from the 70 millimeter screen and the huge soundtracks. And now all of a sudden I had carte blanche. I could actually just say, I want 32 strings and I want, four French horns, want two trombones, I want three trumpets, kettle drums, a suite of woodwinds. And, you know, they would show up at the studio. There was no worry that the bill was not going to be paid. You know, I put that arrangement together at home and I'd say start to finish. It took me about a week to write it and arrange it. Then went over to Armin Steiner's and cut each piece separately because Armin's was not a huge old Hollywood studio uh, like a soundstage. It was a modern, you know, eight track, coom 16 track uh, modern studio and relatively small. And I, I did the rhythm and then I did the, the horns, then I did the woodwinds and then I did the strings. Thinking back on it, it was a wonderful way to record orchestra because you really, you really had a lot of control over each section. They were completely discreet. So really, that's, that's, that's a luxury when you're, you know, uh, you, out, you go out to Wembley to Delane Lay and they've got everything direct into this big nave console uh, and it's all happening live. And there's no way to isolate anything. So when the tape rolls and, there, and there's a drummer playing live and, and three pianos I had in there one day playing at the same time <laughs> and a bunch of strings and a, bu and a bunch of wood ones. And it's just all go going into this big board. And you're just kind of, you know, crossing your fingers and hoping for the best. You're just hoping that everybody does what they're supposed to do. 
and you're 21 years old. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> recording it. Um, I'm looking at the timeline oh, during uh, during the Christmas break. You record it basically over Christmas into the new year. Yes, and then I and then I uh, carried the masters because they were big, uh, fat reels of tape. You know that at least this wide as the technology modernized the the reels became more compact and everything began to it went into a a, a trend of miniaturization that was just overwhelming i mean every, everything got i mean i'm talking to you now i mean we're we're preparing a television show you know on my laptop <laughs> um, you know sitting at my piano at home with a couple of lights the age of, for instance, of Olympic Studios in London, which Richard Branson has turned into a luncheonette, that studio where the Beatles recorded, where the Who recorded, where John Lennon did solo stuff, Harry Nielsen did solo stuff. In fact, I played in that studio on a, on a record of Harry's called Jump Into the Fire. I just played... Oh, and over and over. They put a wrecking ball through the, uh, uh, the largest studio window, double glass window, 60 something feet long, the largest in the world. And that should be at the British Museum. Now I'm telling you, that should be at the British Museum. And uh, Richard's boys, put the wrecking ball through that, through both panes of that, you know, big, thick, tempered glass, because they didn't know how to get it out. out. So uh, it just knocked it into pieces. And through all the records, through all the albums out in the alley, everybody all over Barnes, Terry Oates, my publisher, and all the record people who sort of hid out in barns in, in, at nighttime, we were all over in the alley behind Olympic recorders picking up multi-tracks. And they were like John Lennon. It was Harry Nielsen, The Who. It was, it was like a who's who of 60s rock. And it was just laying out there in the dumpster. So I... I, I I don't know who uh, handled the the peaceful transfer of power between Olympic recorders and Richard Branson, but it wasn't real smooth. You know, and our crowd, and I'll, I'll speak for all of us, we take those things rather seriously. That was an insensitive thing to do. I mean that should that is that should have been curated as a piece of well an important piece of musical history especially that window for Christ's sake that window I mean it hurts me still to think about it you're 21 years old you're doing MacArthur Park you're doing all of these incredible songs you're working at such a high level of arrangement and songwriting how how did you learn this? I was brought up in church, and uh, you know Aretha Franklin. Aretha Franklin would say the same thing. She would say, "I I, I was brought up in church," and you know you're very impressionable when you're six, seven, eight years old, nine years old. And my mom was hammering me with piano lessons at six, and I never particularly cared for playing until I was around 12 or 13 is a way of saying to parents out there, don't necessarily listen to your children when they say, I don't want to do that because you're too young to make that decision when you're six or seven, but you can never replace those years in terms of what you're able to learn. So I learned an incredible amount about music. I could read and write music by the time I was 12 years old. I didn't have to go to college for that. And I had been taught to arrange hymns. Like I would, I would uh, do offertories and I, my version of 
Amazing Grace would be like. Anyway, um, unbelievable, beautiful. So I know, so I knew, I knew a lot about uh, substitution and stuff. So I, I went in, uh, I guess, with a smidge of, of talent. And I would say that talent is probably the least important thing in the equation. But I learned very quickly. I was a quick learner. So once I got in the studio, my eyes and ears were wide open. I was looking at everything, listening to everything. And I was filing away bits of information about which instruments played and which keys, what the ranges of instruments were. Because in the back of my mind, I was going to run an orchestra one day, you know, even if it was just once, you know, I was going to do that. I found that one, one of my techniques for songwriting, which I, I recommend, uh, I, I don't know whether it's, it's uh, feasible anymore, but it worked wonders, miracles for me, was that, you know, um, on the top 40 charts, somebody like Little Anthony and the Imperials, for instance, would put out, I think I'm going out of my head, written by Teddy Randazzo. And it would be a huge hit. And at the record company level, they would say, okay, we need a follow-up. Now, a follow-up in quotations wasn't just a word. It was a, a specific kind of record. And it was a record that was crafted to sound as much like the original record as possible, but not be that record. So theoretically, you're going to stuck in that same group of people who bought the first record because they like that sound. So you put that sound on the record and a kind of a similar song. And maybe you get another hit out of it because you discovered something. And in those days, uh, follow-ups were inevitable. They were inevitable. If, 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 if there was a hit record, you could count on it. There was going to be a sequel back to the movies. There was going to be a sequel to that record. And I got onto that when I was about 12 years old, listening to the Everly Brothers. And the, the guy who was writing a lot of the songs for them was, well, the couple were uh, Felice and Boodle Bryant, who wrote, I'll do my crying in the rain and Kathy's clown. and let it be me and uh, a song on the backside of one of their records called love hurts which i recorded and then everybody in the universe recorded you could put yourself in pos in the position of being the guy who wrote, wrote the follow-up and then you could compare your follow-up to the record company's effort and that was a very good way to calibrate your own progress. Because if, you're, if your follow-up wasn't as good as their follow-up, you'd say, well, I have, I have a, lot, you know, a lot to learn. I got to do some more work. If your follow-up was almost as good as their follow-up, you knew that you were getting in the ballpark where professional songwriters ply their trade. And if you, if you wrote a follow-up song and said, my song beats the crap out of their follow-up, then you were ready to be a professional songwriter. It was, it was really like, it was a mathemat mathematical certainty. You know, and all you, had to, all you had to do is be merciless with yourself and, and, and judge harshly the things that you created against the things that real professionals were creating. And the way it was set up 
Mm -hmm. It was a learning tool. I imagine you were the only person doing that, though. And that's what set you apart. I can't imagine I was. I bet, I bet there were <laughs> other people doing it. Maybe that, maybe that had become professionals, but not sitting at home in Oklahoma. Maybe, <laughs> maybe not. Yeah. Maybe the only guy in Oklahoma yeah. who was doing that. who was doing that. Uh, uh, you said you understood. You know, you understand obviously chord substitutions. Where, where were you learning that kind of information? Well, I, I got that uh, from one person, and her name was Susan Goddard, and she was just a phenomenal teacher. And she knew that I was faking a lot of my lessons because I was playing them by ear. It was just easier to, I, I would say, could you just play it for me so I can hear how it's supposed to sound? And if I g could get her to play it for me, I could, I could learn it. So one day I came in. I came in for my lesson and, and I played some little thing like a minuet, you know, uh, by Mozart or Chopin or something like that. She just took all the music, like the, all this music up here, and she just went. <laughs> and she looked at me and she said, I'm on to you, Jimmy Webb. <laughs> she said, now we're getting somewhere. She said, Let's use that wonderful ear of yours to create some original things. And she opened the door to alternate bases, substitutions, uh, textures like arpeggiation, like things as simple as, you know, little, little effects, things that you would do, tremolo. Most of all, the knowledge that you could play almost anything you wanted to play. She taught me uh, to use my ears, but to use them in conjunction uh, with reading notes, writing notes, and to fashion uh, uh, out of that a weapon, a weapon really, something that would be formidable in the professional arena. The spiritual depths that music has the 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 reason that certain music appeals to other people which is often you know described as you know mystical almost but it's it's not really it's it's whatever you, you, you it's it, it's the garbage in garbage out theory if you invest a spiritual burden in your song if it really comes from the genuine place where that stuff comes from, then other people feel that. They can't help them. They can't help themselves. They feel it. Uh, and it sounds very simple and, oh, well, gee, that's, you know, you're a genius, you know. It sounds very simple, but you, you put it into practice and, and kind of push the commercialism to one side while you're writing and go for something a little bit deeper and reach for something that's a commonality in relationships so that you can help people feel what feel what they're 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 feeling now that sounds ignorant too but a lot of times people don't know how to express what they're feeling. And when you can do that for them, they're very grateful. And, uh, you know, they'll go out and buy your record. But on a, <laughs> on a deeper level, you actually change lives. And I, I, I've been doing this for a long time now. And I've talked to a lot of people about music in general and my music and the way music 
moves into people's lives and affects the way they feel about themselves and the way they feel about other people, certain situations they're going through. There's no price you can put on it, which is why when people put songwriters, creators at the bottom of the financial pole and pay us as little as they possibly can for what we do, I have, a, I have an anger. I have an anger over it uh, because I think that music is so essential to the human, to the human experience. I mean, you, 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 we, we, we get married to it. We have dinner to it. We make love to it. We worship to it. We court and spark to it. We, we party to it. We, we, we rejoice to it. We celebrate to it. We do so much to it. It's so much a part of our lives that if you took it all away just for 24 hours, the world would be an empty place. People would say, oh, no, no, we, we can't go on this way. We, we have to have our music. So how much value does that have? What, what is the value of that? And why then go to the absolute bottom rung of the ladder and pay as little as you possibly can for something that's so essential to human life? Darwin had a great quote. What is it? He said that there was music before there was language. Oh, my God. He, he was smarter than I thought he was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I think that early music was a mnemonic device. It was a rhythmic way of uh, recounting. We know, for instance, that the Norse sagas are some of the early, earliest sort of constructed literature. And they were constructed in such a way that they had a rhythm and a scansion and a pattern that could be remembered so that the stories these, of these great deeds would be remembered and passed down from generation to generation. And by the way, that's the origin of the true ballad, B-A-L-L-A-D, not ballad as in uh, I've got you under my skin. Not, you know, not that kind of ballad, but the 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 the, the sort of um, there is a ship that sails the sea. Which is, you know, uh, a lot of Bob Dylan's writing is is pure ballad writing. It's identical verse after identical verse after identical verse, form wise, and so you could tell great stories. The ballad of Billy the Kid. The ballad of was well, another way of saying this is the story of Billy the Kid. It goes back to the caves back to the caves and the mastery of fire. That's how old songs are. Well, I don't want to take up any more of your time. This has been, I mean, I do, but <laughs> I've got to be respectful of your time. This has been absolutely amazing. Thank you ever so much. I well, really thank you. Uh, I love the fact that you're in a studio. It's my studio. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful. I love the warmth in there. It was always a refuge for me. It was like you went in and the big door closed and the world outside ceased to exist. And you were really, it was a sacred space. It was a dedicated space. And what a shame now, you know, that we see that this is kind of something that it's it's like a few of us, if we really love that sort of thing, we, ha we have a studio or we have access to a studio. 
but I remember when we used to trade publishing for studio time. That's how much we loved studios. Wow. And they were hard to get into and they were expensive. But it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you thank so you. much, Jimmy. I really, really appreciate it. And please uh, thank Laura as well. That was for helping set everything up. Peace and love. Peace man. and love, as Ringo would say, yes. <laughs> <laughs>